we have adjust students, and we have support groups, we have grants, we do educational stuff like this. And then I also work with Mighty Bet. So Mighty Bet is another great well-being focused charity um, who just, the aim of Mighty Bet is to teach us all that stuff that we didn't really learn in vet school, stuff that we need to be successful in our career. And so because I work with these two charities, I actually think a lot about what bothers us. What bothers us as veterinary professionals? And I'll tell you, like, I'm not immune to that stuff. Not at all, right? Like, I'm a veterinarian, much like many of you. And before that, I was a veterinary assistant. So, like, this is my life, right? These things have bothered me, too. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how I kind of learned to find joy in my career again. Because that one really was not easy. Um, so let's go back to sort of the beginning. Let's go back pretty far. 2009. Dinosaurs were roaming the planet. <laughs> And I had just finished my neurology residency, and I moved to California, and I started my practice, right? I'm super excited. This was the culmination of my entire life, right? Like, literally my entire life. It was like, get in a good college, get in a vet school, get a residency, and now I was done. And this was my first health review. I had been in practice a month when this hit the web. Let's review, shall we? <laughs> this guy came in. His cat probably had a meningioma, which is literally my favorite thing in life. Uh, I love cutting meningiomas so much, it's the reason I became a neurologist. So this had a, should have been like my favorite thing that happened that day. The neurologist, Dr. Gurney, was terse, rude, and did not seem to care about my cat. I would never leave any living thing in the hands of someone who was so mean spirited. It gets worse. Not, not that I care that much, but you care enough to put it in the open view. Uh, but her manner of dress is unbecoming both for the veterinary profession and her body type. Ooh. Yep, mean and fat and ugly. Great, thank you very much for your feedback. <laughs> Even better, um, my mom found this review. My mom, who's like a southern belle and like the most important things in life is that you are pretty and nice. Uh, and so she called me to give me a lecture about not being mean to people and to ask how much weight I gained, right? So like, cool, great. So, a very well-intentioned mentor came out with this advice. Has anyone ever heard this advice before? They don't have care how much you know until they know how much you care. Cool. How did you feel when you got that advice? Yeah, I would tell you I was like low-key, not even low-key, I was furious with that advice. How can they not care how much I know? Do you know how long I was in school? It was more than a decade. Other people were like in Europe and going to bars, and I was in the library, right? And don't you want a smart doctor? Like, isn't that the whole point? And I, I do care. At this point, I would argue that I actually cared too much. Every case got triple checked. I stayed late, my records were perfect. I woke up at 2 a.m. worrying about my patients. I came in on my days off. I cared so much, it was actually killing me. How could they not see that I cared? But I'm a competitive girl, I'm an overachiever, and I'm not gonna fail at anything, right? So I took a communications class, right? And like, this class is what I call a procedural communications class. It's a perfectly lovely cat class, and it taught me a lot of the steps in the dance of communication, right? Ask open-ended questions, you know, 94% of what's, what's communicated is actually nonverbal. There's a lot of really great stuff in this class, right? And it worked. These were my next two deck reviews, right? Like, all of a sudden, pets in my hands were in good hands, and I was a great listener. And everybody wanted to see Dr. Journey. So we're done, right? I'm successful? Nah. I was still miserable. Absolutely miserable. Every tense interaction I had with a coworker or a client ate me up inside, right? Every time I just had to choke it down and put on my customer service face, I felt like I was dying inside. And I was wracked with anxiety and guilt and imposter syndrome, and I just didn't know what to do. And I super wish that I just went to therapy and like got it sorted out, right? Like that would be great, but that's just not real life, not at all. Um, I was a hard worker, right? So I just like put my nose down, like this is what it means to build a practice. So for two years I worked as hard as I possibly could. Stayed up later, wrote records better, the whole thing. The troll was gonna get this. I wasn't happy. But you know what, that was probably this practice, right? This practice wasn't right for me. I don't agree with that policy. They're not doing it the way things I want. If I had more control, I would be happy, right? Great, my friends are starting up a new specialty hospital. I'm gonna go do it better than anybody's ever done it before. I'm gonna start my own practice. You'll see, you'll see. And I put my nose down to the grindstone and I worked again for two years. 
I didn't have a day off for two years. It was seven days a week, 365 days for two years. I had cases where I literally slept on the floor of the hospital. Shockingly, that did not result in happiness. Um, I was checking all of the metrics of, of success, right? I was a young, successful practice owner with a growing practice. I had a practice in downtown San Francisco. We own real estate in downtown San Francisco. You know how hard that is? Like, everything should have been going great. It was actually going terrible. And what I know is I was doing this. So suppression is taking all of those negative feelings and like shoving them in a box, right? It is the emotional equivalent of taking your feelings and shoving them in the closet because company's coming over, right? And we all do this. We all do this. Um, it's what's called a socially adaptive construct because like in polite society, it, it's not always okay to express your emotions. Like when you're angry at your client, you can't just reach across the table and punch them in the face, right? Like that's not okay. So like we all do this sometimes and that's okay. But you can't do it all the time because it's actually been linked to things like anxiety and depression. It's even like linked to things like hypertension and heart disease. So if you do this too much, your heart will in fact explode. And this was the only emotional regulation strategy I had at this point. It's the only one that I knew. So it didn't go so well for me. I walked away from my practice. And for the first time in my life, since I was 18 years old, I didn't have a job. And I didn't know what to do because the career that I worked my whole life for made me miserable. It was really, really terrifying. Really terrifying. What the hell is I going to do? And some of that was clinical depression. Some of that was a good old-fashioned life crisis. And some of it was burnout. I had been burning the candle at both ends since I was literally 16 years old. And I needed a break. I really did. So I took some time. God bless my husband. You know, it's expensive to live where we live. And like... We buckled down and made it work, but that was not easy, and I, I give him credit to this day for like letting me sit in yoga pants for four months and not leave our couch. As I started to recover from my burnout, I began to think about how I could possibly be happy. And once my brain got some rest, I started to you know, use my strengths. I'm a nerd, I'm really good at research. So I thought, okay, well, what does happiness even mean? How do people do that? Let's do some research, right? So to the books we went. I, I started reading books like this, books by psychologists. I took some classes from PhD psychologists at the University of Berkeley. And of course, because nerd, I pulled some primary peer-reviewed literature on it. And I really started to build a toolkit of things that would help me be happy. And this book was, was one of those tools. And so we're gonna talk about this structure today. This book also explains a, uh, a great mystery to me. You know, when I started my career, I started to notice that there were these doctors that were, to my young and very judgmental eyes, not anywhere near as good as me. Right? My medicine is clearly perfect, obviously. Uh, toxic perfectionism is actually a different lecture. But regardless, <laughs> I would look at those doctors and say, like, Jesus Christ, look at that guy's complication rate. I worked with a surgeon who had a shockingly high complication but his clients loved him. They drove from hundreds of miles away to see him and would see no one else. And it made me furious. Furious. Turns out, people with average IQs outperform people with high IQs 70% of the time. And as a smart person who's very competitive, right? Like, I'm a total, like, if you're not first, you're last kind of guy. Uh, like, that is infuriating, right? But once again, to not to be outrun, what do the high performers have? Well, they have pretty high EQ, right? 90% of high performers have high emotional intelligence or EQ. And I think we can all relate to this, right? Let's think about a very uh, popular veterinary figure, Dr. Mm -hmm. Polk, right? Mentioning his name at a veterinary conference is like mentioning Voldemort, like honestly. <laughs> uh, like he performs acts of malpractice on live TV every single day. And is beloved. My dentist, while she had the tools in my mouth, was like, God, that Dr. Pole is just great. I was like, you're a medical professional. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? That's the reason for that. Right? That's the reason. So let's get back to this advice that I sort of like still low-key hate because I have PTSD about it, right? Uh, as we peel back the layers, this is what this advice means. 
Nobody really cares about your IQ until they can see your EQ. But of course, being who I am, I could not just like read a book by a PhD psychologist and believe them. So I also pulled a bunch of primary literature to prove to myself that this was the right strategy. So turns out, having high EQ will make you better academically. And even when you can control for IQ, having high EQ, having high EQ will give you better test scores. Not shockingly, your marriage might be better. Your relationships will be better. Also not shockingly, you will have less anxiety and depression. And if you happen to stumble, you're more likely to go put yourself in therapy and get some help. But really, we're talking about work right now. Turns out, no matter what your job is, no matter what, it doesn't matter if you're a, a manager at the McDonald's or a clerical employee at a law firm, Having high EQ is a major determinant of success. And in fact, if you look across all professions, at least 58% of your success is based on your EQ. 58%. And in jobs with high emotional labor, like jobs where you really have to choke down those feelings and smear on your customer service face, those jobs, EQ is an even greater predictor of success. So mental health workers with high EQ, they actually report less burnout, they perceive less work overload, they can deal with their jobs better, and they stay in their jobs longer. So clearly, this is the way that I could start to deal with the problems that I was having in my career. And like, some people have it naturally, right? Good for them. I did not. Uh, and the good news is you can actually teach this, you can learn this. And actually, for every point you elevate your EQ, you're gonna make on average $1,300 more uh, a year in salary. So, if for no other reason than the money, let's, let's get to learning this, right? Okay, so these are the four uh, skills of emotional intelligence. We have self-awareness. You gotta know who you are. And we're gonna talk about doing that. You need to know your strengths, your weaknesses. You need to spend some time thinking about your internal environment and your feelings. And as you think about those feelings, that's gonna help you with emotional control. As you start to understand those feelings and where they came from, you're gonna be able to react to them better. You can't actually control your emotions. You can control how quickly you process them and how you react to them. So that's emotional control. And once we have those two skills down, and so by the way, if you don't live in California where everyone talks like a yoga teacher all the time, that those two skills together are a big part of what's called mindfulness, right? So that's mindfulness. Um, so after we have that skill, we can then start to extend that grace to others. And I think in the veterinary profession, a lot of us think we're pretty naturally empathic. And, and that's true for some, some of us, and, and I think for the most part. But there's some places where we definitely stumble, so we're going to talk about those. And then finally, it's communication skills, right? Which are so, so important. Communication skills are the key to so much. But if you just try to learn communication skills without doing the rest of that stuff, it's like trying to learn sap surgery without learning anatomy, right? Like you can do the steps, but if something goes wrong, you have no idea how to fix it, right? So, so let's, let's do some, some hard work and learn some anatomy, right? Let's talk about self-awareness. It is totally okay to live mindlessly some of the time. If you're ordering coffee at the Starbucks, you do not have to have an emotional check-in about that, right? Like, that is just normal. That's totally fine. Um, but, it's not on a weird slide, I'm really sorry. Um, so, but the whole point of this is to realize where our emotions have, like, grabbed the steering wheel so we can wrestle some control back. So let's talk about self-awareness. So most of us actually need to spend the most time here. And it really seems like pokey and a little hippie and I'm really allergic to woo, but honestly, like, these are the building blocks for the rest of these skills. So, we're going to work on the physical symptoms of our emotions, we're going to work on emotional vocabulary, we're going to work on our personality traits, and then we're going to talk about our values. So, I'm going to walk you through some exercises. Um, it's a lot like explaining to someone how you train for a marathon, though. Like, we're going to walk through these exercises, just like I could tell you how to train for a marathon. But you cannot walk out of this room and expect to train, train for a marathon just because you watch a PowerPoint presentation, right? Same thing here. If you don't do this work for yourself, this lecture is just going to be a way you spend an hour on a Sunday, right? And I super appreciate you did. But I wanted to do more for you. So, let's talk about physical symptoms of our emotions, right? Like, that's usually the, the first clue many of us have that, like, emotions are happening right now. So, medical professionals, please diagnose your symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, let's break our emotions into five categories. Lots of these different books have different categories. It doesn't really matter. Pick your five or five. I think this is a, a fair five. And so, like, wh what do you feel like physically when you're sad? Who cries? I'm a crier. I'm a super crier, actually. I cry when I'm happy. 
probably when I'm sad, probably when I'm angry. So like crying is a real symptom for me, but it's not a discerning one, right? When I'm angry though, and Lord, I have a temper. Ooh. When I'm angry, like the very top of my head gets starts to tingle, and that's like danger, little Robert's in danger. Like something is happening. Figure that out. Which is different from when I'm ashamed. I don't actually have a lot of shame neurons in my body, but like the ones that I do make me blush super hard. So this can be the first clue of what's happening internally. And that can lead us to think a little bit more about what's happening. Um, you know, clearly we have more than five emotions, right? If you don't believe me that you have more than five emotions, there are actually 86 emoticons, little faces <laughs> that are meant to express emotions. So there are 86 of those. So you have at least 86 emotions, at least. And real talk, we use a lot of things that aren't faces to express emotions, right? Like everybody can use those in a sentence, right? Like we all know what those mean. So there are actually over 3,000 emojis in regular use right now. So if we can spend enough time thinking about our feelings to pick an emoji out of 3,000 emojis, I think we can apply that work to our internal environment as well. So let's say your physical symptoms have told you you're sad. Like, what type of sad are you? Like sad is fine, but like sad is something that a three-year-old expresses. Let's do a little better than that. Like what type of sad are you? Are you stressed? Are you concerned about one of your friends? Are you heartbroken right now? Are you grieving? Are you tired? And as you start to break down what emotion you're actually feeling, you can see that naturally it kind of leads you to a solution. The solution for being heartbroken is different than the solution for being concerned about a friend. Sometimes you have them together, but they have different solutions. The solution for being concerned is different than being tired. If you're concerned, like a nap's not gonna hurt, but it's not gonna fix it entirely, right? So thinking about this can really lead us to solutions. As we're thinking about emotions, we're gonna have unpleasant ones. I mean, that's the reality when we use this most of the time, right, for unpleasant emotions. I want you to just take in internally that unpleasant feelings are not bad feelings. It's not wrong to have those feelings, right? I have temper. Getting mad at myself because I'm having a temper or being ashamed of my temper doesn't actually help me control my temper. And like, we all feel bad sometimes. Honestly, like, bad stuff happens to everybody. It's natural. And like, constantly chasing positivity, expecting yourself to feel happy all the time is kind of creepy and pathologic, right? Like, don't do that. When I accidentally stuck the drill through a dog's spinal cord during surgery, being happy in that moment would have been quite odd. Ashamed, anger, fear, all of those quite normal and quite present. Happy? Eh, no, not right now. But those are all rational reactions, right? So we need to let go of judging them and we don't need to just take any ones that we don't like and put them in the box, right? Don't suppress. We all have an inner monologue. Actually, sidebar, there was this weird Twitter feed the other day where somebody was like, not everybody has this, and I was as blown away as everybody else, but most of us do. And like, most of the time, that's just how we narrate the world, but sometimes that inner monologue can be a real judgy bitch. Uh, and so, it's particularly when we're looking at ourselves, right, particularly then. And so, I would encourage you to work on changing that judgy internal monologue into an observer. You don't need an inner critic, you need an inner observer. And as we build this non-emotional construct in our mind, it gives us a space to go to, to think about our feelings, even when our feelings are really intense and unpleasant. And so if you can't do that easily, this is where mindfulness can really help you. So mindfulness is a practice that helps you build this construct. And so there are a thousand ways to learn mindfulness, absolutely. The Headspace app, the 10% Happier app, just Google it, you'll find a million, right? Um, so I would encourage you to work on that. We've gotten a long way. Just that work will be tremendously helpful for you. You know your physical symptoms and you know how to think about your feelings and you're starting to understand them a little bit more. Let's talk about our personality. Most of us like have an idea of who we are, at least who we'd like to be. Oh my God, oh, there. Uh, at least who we'd like to be. Um, but to get to the real root of our personality, sometimes we need a little bit of help. And that's what this phrase means. You can't read the label from inside the jar. You need a little bit of help. Sue Edinger actually used that slide in one of her lectures once. It was the best thing I've ever seen. So we need a little bit of help to really understand who we are. So I like this exercise. It really lands pretty well with veterinary professionals, right? We, most of us really like animals and understand them quite well. Uh, so guys, what sort of dog or cat are you? Seriously, like what breed <laughs> is the one that you are? 
Not the one you like or the one you own, like the one that you are, right? And this exercise particularly speaks to me because a friend, Dr. Cindy Courtney, who runs a great site called The Jerk Researcher, uh, was having a lot of trouble at work. Her text thought she was mean, she, wasn't, she was perceived as a bad communicator, and it broke her heart. Because in her heart, she really wanted to be a jackal. She wanted to be a gold retriever. That's what she wanted. She was actually a jackal retriever, a jackal terrier, right? That's who she actually is. And a moment of self-acceptance. There are people in the world that love every type of dog, right? So like, it is okay if you're a Jack Russell Terrier. Stop pretending to be a gold retriever. So once you know which one you are, go with your gut here. Describe it. What are they like? Once you have those on a list down, like what strengths do you share with them? And what weaknesses do you share? And honestly, once you do this homework, check in with a friend. I'll tell you, for a long time, even while I was lecturing on this, I presented as a Labrador, which is just not quite right. This, however, is a little <laughs> bit more accurate. Um, so what are Bengals like? They are really energetic, they're really talkative, they are quite silly. Uh, they love new things, they want sparkly all the time. The cat toy area in my house is insane. It's insane, it's like a whole bedroom. Uh, they like to be the center of attention. They can be a bit much for some people. Not everybody wants one of those in their house, including my husband. When we got this creature, his first like thing that he screamed in the middle of the fight was, this is not the Serengeti, like, <laughs> can be a bit much. And they certainly have a temper. This is right after I told Monster No about something, uh, and I'm pretty sure he's just figuring out which of my shoes he's about to pee in, right? <laughs> so, you know, but he is my soul. And we are a lot of life. So, I am energetic and actually talking and silly, and I love new sparkly things more than anything in the world. More than anything. I really like to be the center of attention too. I really do. And like sometimes that's great. Like when you're lecturing, for instance, like it's an appropriate time to be the center of attention. But certainly that's not great all of the time, right? Like eh, sometimes it's it's better to take a step back. And that talkative stuff, well, much like my cat, I am not a naturally great listener, and it's something I've really had to work on. And uh, that silly stuff, I actually have trouble being professional when I probably should be. You may have noticed I've tossed a few times in this lecture. Sorry, this lecture is rated PG-13. I apologize if that offends you. Uh, <laughs> I can be a bit much for some people. Like, more than one introvert has like backed away with their hands up with like fear or terror at me. I get that. I understand. I do need constant stimulation. And if I don't give my brain stuff to do, she will go find some mischief to do. So I really need to keep myself quite up. And Lord, I have a temper. I mean, we've talked about it a few times. It's a real thing. And if you piss me off, I will piss in your shoes. So, like, <laughs> that's real. That's real for me. So, other than showing you pictures of my cat, which is like my full-time hobby, uh, why are we doing this, right? Well, until you really understand your personality and your strengths and weaknesses, you're going to have trouble succeeding. You're not going to necessarily put, you, put yourself in environments where you are going to succeed. We all come to the world with this idea of what success looks like, right? We all want to try to climb that tree of life. But real talk, like if you're struggling with climbing that tree of life, you're unhappy, something's not clicking for you, it may be because you're a fish and not a monkey, right? And that's okay. That's okay. So me, I need sparkly new things all the time. I can't sit still. I really like pretty high drama, and I'm really bad at like long-term stuff. I don't want to look at your blood work over 10 years. I don't want a long-term relationship with my clients. I think my favorite phrase in the clinic is treat them and treat them. Like, honestly, I want to fix your dog and I want you to go away, um, which is great. I am well suited for emergency medicine. I am well suited for neurology, because the real talk about neurology, like stuff's either dead or better pretty quickly. Um, so that's just reality. <laughs> but it would make me a pretty terrible internist. Like, I would be maybe the worst oncologist on the planet. I probably actually would not even thrive in GP because long-term relationships, that, that does not complete me. So doing this work helps you figure out where you're gonna feel fulfilled. It also lets you know about where you need to work a little harder. Like for me, I'm bad at blood work and long-term stuff, right? I have to treat epileptics, it's part of my job. I hate it, I hate it, but I still have to do it. But because I know this about myself, I make myself focus, I make myself do it, and I put systems in place to help me because I know it's a weakness. So that's why this work is important. And then we start to brush against our values. So our values are the things we, oh, 
value. Uh, they are how we believe the world should work. When you are having fulfilled values, frankly, you are going to feel pretty good about life. You're going to be pretty content. When somebody steps on one of your values, ooh, get ready for a fight, right? And as we try to explore our values, I think about this structure. I would say that there are like three levels of importance that people put on stuff. Objective facts are really boring. There's stuff that people don't really care to talk about because why would you talk about them? Like that's a chair, right? Like that, who's gonna argue with me that that's a chair? Probably no one, right? The wall is brown. Okay, maybe you say it's tan, but like we're not gonna have a heated argument about it, right? So like objective facts are kind of the thing, right? And they can be helpful because when you're struggling you wanna come back here and just check on those. Opinions, opinions are great. Everybody has them. And we're really good at talking about our opinions, right? Like we can both be passionate about our opinions and believe that other people can have different opinions. If I tell you that my favorite TV show is The Magicians and that it's the best thing that's ever been on television and, and you should absolutely watch it, you might say like, actually I like Saturday Night Live better. And like, we may talk about it, but I'm not gonna leave that conversation thinking you're a terrible person, right? Like we're probably not gonna have an argument argument about it. Because we can accept that like, we can have different opinions. And after this conversation about why, why we both love these things, like maybe we actually go check out each other's shows, right? So opinions are where we really have the best conversations. Then we get to beliefs. Oh, beliefs. So beliefs are like things that people fight and die for, right? This is real God and country type stuff. It's the reason that it's not polite to talk about politics and religion at Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like, because that stuff lives in the belief space for most people, right? And you may be thinking, Carrie, you are such a squirrel. Get back on track. We're talking about work, not politics. We're not going to talk about politics. <laughs> I would argue you have things in your work life that are sneaking into this belief space more than you realize. And to access those, let's think about what really pisses you off. I have been the head moderator of Nambi for five years. I know what pisses you off. Let's see how good I am at it. <laughs> You're just in it for the money. Anybody heart rate just go up? I actually, I wrote that slide in my head stealing right now, like, angry. You're not a real doctor. You're not a real nurse. Maybe if you're a CBT or an RBT, you're like, I'm not a nurse at all. Like, I mean, honestly, right? My breeder says that Yorkies are allergic to lepto. I need half those jack vaccines. I saw a YouTube video. <laughs> grain free food is like totally better. Dogs are allergic to grains. Wolves don't eat grains. No. <laughs> ah! like, no, no. In your head, you have like a 10 page bulleted argument. You have already started to pull up the FDA report on cardiomyopathy on your phone and you are ready to go. So like that's helpful, right? Like we have found something that is important to you and it's worth thinking about like which of your values is been stepped on right now. Because let me tell you otherwise, your emotional activation on this is not doing you any favors. It's not doing you any favors. How many of you really love it when somebody climbs up on a stove, soapbox, like points their finger at you and tells you what you're gonna do? Has anybody in here ever like been convinced and changed their mind from a Facebook fight? No. no. Nobody likes that stuff. Nobody does. And when we tread into the belief space, that's where we go. Because it's so important to us. We're so angry. We just have to tell you why you're wrong. But nobody listens when you're that activated. So I would tell you, you need to bring that stuff that's in belief back down to the opinion level of energy. It doesn't mean it's not important to you. It's absolutely important to you. It doesn't mean it's not just important. But nobody's going to listen to you if you are lecturing them from the soapbox. But Lord, that's hard, man, right? How do we do that? I love this area. I mean, I'm, I'm a neurologist, right? Of course I love this slide. Uh, <laughs> one of the fathers of emotional intelligence, Dr. Daniel Golden, uh, postulated this theory about the amygdala hijack. So your amygdala is the part of your brain that really developed, evolved over millennia to keep you alive. It is your flight or flight response. Like, this is where that lives. So it is really, really strong. It's really good as a job, because it's literally life or death, the reason that it evolved. And it's where emotions like anger and fear and anxiety, it's where it lives, right? So when we're feeling those emotions, we, a lot of blood is rushing to our amygdala, right? And other parts of our brain, like our frontal lobe, where we actually make calm, rational decisions, are getting a little hypoxic right now. So. When we feel like we're ready to pick up the sword and shield, when we feel like we want to run for our life, 
That is the fault of our amygdala. So how do we wrestle back control? Well, you take a breath. Now, I'm not just going to tell you to take a deep breath, right? Because that doesn't always work. And the reason that we even say that at all is what you're trying to do is take over an automatic process. You are all breathing right now because you're all alive, I hope. Uh, but you're breathing right now, but you can then think, I'm going to breathe this way and take it over, right? And that is engaging your frontal lobe. You're engaging your rational brain. And there are different levels of how hard that is, right? So the first one is pretty easy. And it's something you can actually like do in an exam room while somebody's yelling at you, right? So like you can take a breath that where your inhale is twice is half as long as your exhale. So you're going to inhale for two and exhale for four, right? Everybody we're going to do it together. One, two. One, two, three, four. Do it as many times as you need to. If you don't think it's working, the next one that I do, as a nerd, I actually trace a molecule of oxygen, which is blue, by the way, all the way through my respiratory tree. All the way. Nose, neuropharynx, oropharynx, larynx, trachea, trachea. Like, I do the whole thing all the way to the alveoli. I exchange it. It becomes orange, and then I breathe it out. And I have to think about it. I'm a neurologist, not a respiratory physiologist. So I have to actually think like bronchial, I'll be, and that helps, right? Like I'm engaging my rational brain. But like I said, I have a really bad temper, so sometimes even that's not enough. And that's where this one comes in. So this is called alternative nasal breathing. We're gonna do it together. This one is hard, right? This is like one of these situations. Um, and there are a lot of videos on YouTube. Uh, Yoga with Adrian's video on it is actually my favorite. Yay, everyone loves her, she's great. Uh, all the yogi people do this like crazy thing with their hand that I can't actually do. Uh, so you can just do the hang loose. All right, we're gonna block our right nostril. We're gonna breathe in through our left. Switch, block your left nostril, breathe out through your right. Breathe in through your right. Switch, breathe out through your left. I mean, I wrote this line. I had to think about that really, really hard. I was practicing it last night. I was like, this is the part that I screw up. And that's probably good because it means it's really hard, right? Now, don't do that in the room with a client, right? Like, that's weird. Uh, but, but, like, if you're, a, if you're having a lot of trouble, if you're going to have to call that client, which makes your blood pressure go up every time you see her on the caller ID, like, when that's happening, like, go in the bathroom and, you know, do this for a minute. <laughs> I had a friend from Vegas tell me, don't do that on the casino floor. People are going to think something different about you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're calm again. Thank God. What's up? What did you notice? Which physical symptom was it? All right, why? Why are you angry right now? Why? Is it one of your values? Like, what's happening? And is anything else contributing? This is real talk. Like, hangry is real, guys. Like, hangry is a thing. It is an actual problem in our lives. Um, so, when I am really struggling to control my own emotions, I do this checklist because I need to make sure the thing I'm struggling with is just like a value problem and not also that I'm hangry. So, have you eaten in the last two hours? And like, I'm real food motivated, so usually the answer is yes. But like, what have you eaten? This is why I keep protein bars in my drawer, so I don't eat a three-day-old donut because I'm hangry, right? Have you eaten? And any water? Please note I did not say coffee or alcohol. Water. <laughs> Go get some. Have you, have you peed? Related to the water, did you pee, everybody? Because we all know, sometimes no. You can take five minutes at that point and you can't wait. Go pee. Go pee. Have you stood up and walked 100 steps in the last hour? I mean, God, yes, in the clinic. Like, actually add a zero to that. But if I've been doing phone calls or records or writing lectures or something, like, stretch your legs for a minute. Totally. How about a shower? So this is more talking about your general hygiene. If you're really depressed, shower is something, like, that can be hard. So that can be it. But for me, this means, like, are I doing the hygiene things that matter to me? Like, the things that I need to do to feel like myself. So for me, like, I don't actually like to wear scrubs to work. I like to, like, dress in my, like, doctor clothes and, like, put makeup on and do my hair. Now, you don't have to put on makeup for this healthcare check checklist if that's not your thing, but you know what your stuff is. Like, have you done your stuff? And then sleeping. I'm an insomniac, so like, this one is big for me. It is both a reason that I'm not doing well and a reason I will continue to not do well. And like, some of these we can do in the moment, right? Some of these we can do at work. We can drink water and sometimes even pee. <laughs> but like, taking a nap is not a reality for many of us. So, you know, do what you can to get yourself in a place where you can deal with the stress. 
We're ninjas of our own emotions now, right? Absolute masters. So let's talk about other people. I am not a natural listener. I'm just not. So listening was a hard skill for me. I could put on the listening face, but my brain was doing a thousand other things. So the, the first phrase that really helped me become a better listener was, listening is not just waiting for your turn to talk. That one really stuck with me, really did. I was like, oh, okay, let me try again. And like some of the procedural stuff you're taught in, in, in classes like Frank is great here, right? And those were the, head, the, tip, the tricks that I used to like make myself do this when it was really hard for me. Ask an open-ended question. Don't assume that you know why they're there or what they're feeling or anything. Ask them, actually ask them. And then if you're having trouble paying attention and listening because you're hungry and you need to pee or whatever, like I like to use reflexive listening as a game with myself to make myself listen to them. Carrie, you are gonna have to repeat back to Mrs. Smith in a minute what's happening. If you don't pay attention, you can't do it. So pay attention. Competitive brain likes that, so that helps. Okay, Mrs. Smith, uh, so I hear that Fluffy is not eating this weekend and has, had, has vomited four times, and that's why you're concerned? And Mrs. Smith is gonna say, actually, I'm most concerned that he hasn't pooped in three days, because that's reality. Um, and we all know that you actually have to eat food to make poop, but we need to explain that to Mrs. Smith, because she's gonna shove a lot of laxatives in that dog while it's vomiting, and that's not what we need to do, right? So we need to actually know what she's concerned about before we can move forward. And then there's empathic listening. And empathic listening is listening with the intent to name their feeling back to them with the hope that it helps them realize what their feelings are and helps them control it. It's really great for the screaming client. Mr. Jones, I completely get you're frustrated. I get it. Uh, the diagnostics haven't been conclusive. I can't tell you why your dog's sick. And I'll be honest, like I'm pretty frustrated too. And it just gives everybody like a moment to understand that like emotions are okay. We recognize you're having them. Let's work together, right? It's a nice reset. But here's where I think veterinarians fall down on empathy, right? I think a lot of us have what I would call leaky emotional syndrome. All empathy means is that you recognize someone else's emotions. It does not mean you have to take them on as your own. You don't have to be angry because someone else is angry. You don't have to be sad because they're sad. And as we build self-awareness and control, we can actually start to pick out which emotions are ours and which are other people's. And get rid of the ones that aren't ours, right? They're not yours. It's okay to recognize and even care that somebody else is sad or angry. But you don't need to have that yourself. That's theirs. Give it back. And as you're starting to think about other people, everybody tells themselves narratives, right? Everybody. We build a reason in our head that somebody's doing the thing that they're doing. And it's actually part of empathic listening, right? Like, I guess that Mr. Jones is frustrated about the diagnostics. Maybe he told me that or not. But as we're telling these stories to ourselves, it's really important to look for fictional characters, right? Like, real life does not have mustache twirling, vill twirling villains or damsels in distress. And as while you always have a starring role in your narrative, you are not a hero and you are not a martyr. And Lord, I love to be a martyr. Ooh, I love it. Uh, so much so that I made my therapist call me on it. I was like, can you just please call me out when I'm acting like a martyr? She's like, yep, put it in your chart. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we figure out that we're doing this? Well, you know, the truth is like people are people and most people are doing their best. So if you are making someone a villain, you usually will ascribe to them a really nasty name. That guy's a jerk. I'm flipped him, he's always a jerk. And like, okay. Like, we'll talk. All of us have been a jerk at some point, like that's just real life. But that guy is not a hundred percent a jerk, he's being a jerk right now, right? So walk back your story to something that's a little bit more reasonable. Victims talk in absolutes. They all like the other doctor more. No one ever wants to see me. I never get this right. I mean, just in saying those words, you can hear that there's a little bit of melodrama there, right? So like, those are victim words. If you start using absolutes, like, check yourself, please. And as we're trying to create better stories about other people, we remember perspective. It is possible for two people to have opinions that are entirely different and still be right. Look at these guys. They're both looking at the same thing. They're standing in the same room. One of them sees a six and one sees a nine, and that's actually completely accurate, right? It should be an objective fact that's on the floor, but the, the position that you're looking at it in actually can change it. And that's so important to realize. Which brings me to this. This is another piece of veterinary mice that kind of like low key inferior. You, you can't care more about their dog than they do. 
Who's heard that one? Yeah, so we all know that it feels that way sometimes, right? Absolutely it does. She is sitting there with a Gucci bag and those shoes, and I know that Mercedes is hers in the parking lot. And why won't she just let me run this blood work that this dog really, really needs? I just want to take care of her dog. Why do I care more about her dog than she does, right? All right, veterinarian, that'll help. Get the blood out of your amygdala. That person picked that dog out. They named it. They fed it. They booked an appointment. They came to your hospital. So we need to just admit to ourselves, they care about their dog too, right? It's not a pissing match. Do not set yourself up to be your client's adversary, right? We need a partnership here. So try to find a level where you can, can get with them and be a partner. And when I'm struggling with it, which I do, I actually say this out loud. I know you care about your dog, or you wouldn't even be here today. If my client feels judged or if I feel like I'm judging them, I just say that in the appointment. And it often resets the conversation. It makes us partners. We want to work together. I know you care. Maybe we have different value structures. Maybe we have different perspectives. But we can share this one, and that's where we can work from. Because I think that one, that top piece of advice, is really a failure, failure of empathy. We're saying to ourselves, we're paying ourselves as a martyr. Well, I clearly care more than everyone, and I just can't do it anymore. Like, martyr, victim, like, villain, all in that phrase. So while I think it starts to be good advice, I think we can do better. Now we're just talking to people, right? We're talking to other people now. We're communicating. There is nothing wrong with this training. If anyone from Frank is here, like honestly, it's good training. I'm glad I had it. There's nothing wrong with it. But where it failed me is everything in this training is about the customer. Everything. It's making sure that they're happy that they're calm, that they're communicated with, everything is about them. The only mention of my feelings in this training is if you are having feelings and it's showing up in your body language, get that under control. That's it. It teaches us to suppress. Sometimes we gotta do that. We can't do it all the time. And truly, if you wanna be a good communicator, this shouldn't be your go-to suppression. I really like this book. When I'm having someone on my team who's having trouble communicating, I buy them a copy of it. Amazon told me the other day that I bought 15 copies of this book. Like, I love this book. It's a very quick read. And it's a communication system that works through an emotional intelligence. So, the first step is to start with heart. Really, just, you need to give a crap. That's what that's saying. Like, uh, <laughs> so really, get your head in the game, right? Go into the room with good intent. Assume they have good intent. You know, and if you're having trouble doing that, because sometimes we do, Real talk, you're probably burned out. That's some burnout talking. You care about your career enough to have pursued this career. You do care about this. If you're having trouble, compassion, fatigue, bur burnout, those are real things. And you might need to really look at how you can treat that first before you can be successful with this. Learn to love. So, like I said, you don't need to do this stuff all the time, right? Like, you do not need to have an emotional check-in, even for many of your appointments, right? That routine thing, like, it's totally fine to just kind of be go on, on autopilot. However, you need to be looking enough to make sure that everybody's on autopilot, right? You need to make sure that emotions haven't grabbed your wheel and that your client looks okay too. Remember, 94% of communication is nonverbal. So like, look, just look enough to make sure everything's okay and otherwise it's totally fine to just skate through. But if you've noticed that someone's amygdala is activated, we need to like, pull back and we need to make it safe again. Nobody's dying here today. As much as it ticks you off that Mrs. Smith wants to treat her dog's fleas with cinnamon oil, that will not kill Fluffy, nor will it kill you. So everybody needs to calm down, right? So do whatever you can to get the blood out of your amygdala and into your rational brain. If your client's the person that's writing in their amygdala, use an empathic listening statement. Help them think about it. If you're there, take a deep breath. Watch out for these guys, not real life. And it's totally okay to talk about what you believe in. It's totally okay, you need to, that's, that's actually your job. But make sure you're talking about an opinion and not a belief, so people will actually listen to you. Let other people tell you what their opinion is. You can't understand their perspective if you don't listen to them. And then together, we make a plan. 
A collaboratively made plan is always followed better. Always, it always works better. So like, for me, I'm a neurologist, right? So it's really common for people, vets even, to ask me, well, what's your favorite seizure medication? And I, the, the answer is it depends, which infuriates everyone, I'm sorry, but that's the actual answer. Uh, because it's more complicated than that. Like, what's good for me? Well, my values say we should do evidence-based medicine. We should follow the peer review. Well, in seizure medication, the actual peer-reviewed medication is phenobarbital. That's the actual seizure medication with the best peer review and the best evidence. So for me, like, that's the one. But what about my client? If they're really concerned about side effects, that medication might not be a good choice for them. And they're not gonna wanna get it, and they're maybe gonna go get a different opinion or read some terrible dog blog. Like, we need to get their buy-in here. So they tell me, I'm really worried about side effects. Well, okay, like maybe Kefir's better for you then. Can you give it three times a day? No? Okay, well, let's talk about another one, right? And so you can see, as we build through, we find something that we can both live with. And I can way more that they actually treat the dog seizures than I get my first choice, right? Because I brought my activation back down to opinion. It's okay to check with your values as you're doing this too. If someone tells me they want to treat their dog holistically, it's not me. I'm not mad at them for it, it's not my dog. That's your value structure. We're never gonna be aligned. I want you to find a doctor that can help you. Here's a list of referrals to other doctors. And that's okay too. You have chosen a job with tremendous emotional labor. That's just reality. It can be a very rewarding one though. But you can't deal with all that stress by just shoving it in a box and smearing on your customer service face. So I'd really recommend that you work on these skills to make your job a whole lot happier. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're going to have a five minute break and then Dusty from Blue Hunter Consulting is actually going to teach you some tips so your clients don't get their amygdala activated before you're even in the room. So it's a really great lecture and I hope you stay for it. Um, but thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.